Welcome to chapel. Please stand and worship with us.
not a lot of people who get to worship twice a week, and it's required at school. I thank you so much for all the people here and the faculty that support us. We don't always see what you have for us, but your plan is better than ours. And help us to follow that and help us to let our light shine for you and let us be examples for you. Keep us safe as we listen to the speaker and as we go from this place. Keep everybody healthy. Good morning. We uh, have a speaker, uh, Jake Watkins from uh, Cross City Church. He is the pastor of the uh, college pastor. And um, I'm always intrigued when I ask or we ask a speaker to come and they begin praying for us. And they begin praying to the Lord and asking for wisdom about what to share. I'm always intrigued what the Lord puts on their hearts. And so I just give him a, a big hand and welcome him. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm excited to share. Um, I think God has been moving on my heart. Um, and there's this, uh, just this thing I want to talk about today. But uh, I'm excited because I've heard so many amazing things about this school. Um, not just about the school, but about you as students and what God is doing uh, in and through you. And I wholeheartedly agree with what this school has been uh, teaching you guys. And I know that you've been growing and learning in what it means to be an Emmanuel man and an Emmanuel woman. What it means to live, really, what Emmanuel man and Emmanuel woman is, is simply a follower of Jesus. What does it mean to be a real follower of Jesus. It's what Jesus calls any and every Christian to be. And you've been learning and growing in the fact that the world doesn't get to tell you who you are or what your identity is, but that God, your maker, has given you an identity and he knows who you are and who he's called you to be. And, and so there's many things we think of when we think of a person whose identity is found in God, right? We think of an Emmanuel man or Emmanuel woman, and when we think of that, we think of someone who's strong in their faith. We think of someone whose ideals and values are unwavering in a world that always wants to change them. When we think of an Emmanuel man or an Emmanuel woman, uh, we think of someone who's strong in, 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 their, uh, in their, their promise of peace that they've received from Jesus, or the joy in the middle of storms of life. We think of someone who has hope in hopeless situations. And, and when we think of these characteristics, if we were to list them out, if you had to list uh, what an Emmanuel man or an Emmanuel woman looks like, what would be on that list? I think mentally we have an idea of what we think and believe would be on that list. But can I ask you, would kindness make the list? Would kindness make the list? And, and I think the reality is that we live in a world that is extremely unkind. And as I've been thinking about what I want to uh, teach on today, I, I just keep seeing things in the news, things on social media, things that just make me realize that the world is completely unkind. In fact, we live in a world where kindness is newsworthy. I mean, if you listen to the radio, there's some radio stations that have a segment, and it's like, tell me something good. You know what I'm talking about? It's because kindness in our world is newsworthy today. That's why people film their acts of kindness, upload them to YouTube, and they get millions of views. Why? Because kindness has become entertaining to us. I mean, we have countries that are literally invading other countries for no reason. I mean, unkindness is, is all around us. In fact, I believe we live in a, a world that's so unkind that kindness has become countercultural. And so today, I want to change the way we think about kindness because being kind has immense value. It has value to us and it has value to others. Kindness is countercultural in the world we live in. Can I say this, that Jesus doesn't call us to be comfortable. Jesus calls us to be countercultural. Jesus doesn't call us to be comfortable. Jesus calls us to be countercultural. He wants us to live lives that look different. 
He says, true followers of him will look different than the rest of the world. And this will be the evidence that the Holy Spirit is active in your life. And I don't know if you know this or not, but God has a lot to say about kindness. It's actually a big deal to him. So in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, who's God's chosen people? You. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and what? Kindness. Kindness. Can I speak a, can I speak a hard truth? Can I, can I give you a hard truth this morning? Is that okay? Nod your head yes if you're alive, please. If you're breathing this morning, nod your head yes. I want to give you this hard truth. You and I put more effort into looking nice than into being nice. I mean, it's true. I, you and I, I, I think we, sometimes we spend more time looking in the mirror in the morning than we do actually uh, reading our Bibles. I mean, we, we, we dress to impress, right? We, we try to get the nice clothes and shoes, not just because we like them, but because we think other people are going to like them. And, and, and notice that about us. But I want to tell you this. It doesn't matter how good you look on the outside. If you're ugly on the inside, no one wants to be around you, right? Like you could be the most beautiful person on the planet, but if you've got a stank attitude, like nobody wants to be around you. Come on, you know that person. And so how, it's just like this is why God says to clothe yourself in kindness. Look at this in Philippians chapter 4 verse 5. It says your kindness should be known to all. In other words, I don't know if you're taking notes. You can make a mental note. Uh, it, in other words, this, kindness should be what people notice about you. Kindness should be what people notice about you. It, it should be a defining trait. If I had asked your friends or your family, uh, what, what, what would they say about you? And what, how would you define uh, this person? What would they say? How you live your life currently, what would you be recognized for? Would you be recognized for your kindness? Can I be, can I be honest with you? Uh, I haven't been the best uh, with this in my life. In fact, uh, I was just recently thinking about this one time in high school. I was in the drive through at a McDonald's, and I pull up to the pay window. And McDonald's is one of the only places that, like, uses both windows. You know what I mean? Taco Bell is like a one-window place. They're like, forget that first window. I'm like, I like you, Taco Bell. You're making my life easy. But McDonald's is like a two-window place. So you drive up to the first window, and you pay for your meal. And then the second window, you get it, and you go, right? And so I pull up to the first window, and uh, I have my, you know, debit card out. I'm ready to pay for my meal. And the lady at the window goes, hey, the person in front of you, paid for your meal. I was like, oh, no way. So, like, I don't have to pay anything. She's like, no. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. What do I, like, did I know them or anything? And she's like, no, this has actually been going on for hours. And each person that comes to the drive through the person in front of them pays, and then that person pays for the next person. She's like, it's been going on since before I got here, and it just keeps going, keeps going. I was like, oh, wow, that's crazy. And she's like, so, do you want to pay for the next person? I was like, no. And I drove to the next window because in my head, I was like, if my meal is free, why would I pay for the next person? Because then, like, that's, I should have just paid for my own meal. And what if the person behind me is, like, picking up McDonald's for a party? Like, I'm not trying to pay $600 at McDonald's. You know what I mean? She swipes my card and hands me my receipt and my whole banking account's overdrawn. I got to be like, Mom, I need money. Like, I don't know what happened. And so in my head, I was like, you know what? It's probably not worth it for me to be kind in this situation. And I was kind of looking out for myself. I I was being a little selfish. And so in that moment, man, would kindness be what they said about me? No, I just ruined hours of people being kind to each other because I wanted to be selfish. And see, I think you should be famous in your circle for your kindness. It should be one of the first things that people say about you. They should know you for your kindness. And so what, what does that look like? What is kindness? And I think we could have many definitions of kindness, but I want to look at biblical kindness because if something's not biblical, then it's not worth it. And so I want to look at biblical kindness. And so look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14, it says, everything you do must be done in love. 
And so what's the connection between kindness and love? If you're taking mental notes or if you're writing something down, I want you to put this. The connection between kindness and love is that kindness is love in action. Kindness is simply love in action. Kindness is not an emotion. Kindness is not a feeling. Like we can think we're being kind to someone just because we have good feelings about them. But if you're not actually being kind to them, then you're not actually being kind. See, kindness is not a feeling. It's an action. It is love in action. So I want you to keep that in your mind right now as we look at Luke chapter 10 uh, and as we read this story about an interaction Jesus had. It says this, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. He said, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. And the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, now what's going on here, it, what, what's happening is, is that really this guy's saying, hey, what, what, what do I need to do to, to make it to heaven? And Jesus says, you just need to love. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so this guy, he doesn't want to have to love everybody. <laughs> he says, surely, Jesus, you don't mean I, I have to love the whole world, right? That I have to love people I don't like, my enemies. That I don't have to love kids from really high school, right? Like, I, that, that, I don't have to do that. What he was looking for was he was looking for a loophole. I mean, you ever look for a loophole? I know you do. Like when your parents ask you to clean your room. And you're like, okay. And so you just shove everything in the closet and like under your bed. You didn't clean anything. You just moved the mess, right? You're just looking for, you're like, it looks clean, right? Like it's clean. How many of you have siblings? Okay. How about when your sibling is like, stop touching me. And so you're like, all right. And you get as close as possible. You're like, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. And they're like, stop it. And you're like, I'm not touching you. You're looking for a loophole. You're still annoying the heck out of them, right? You're just not touching them. And you're like, I'm not touching you. I'm not, I'm not doing that. We, you and I constantly, every day, look for loopholes. And so this man, he was talking to Jesus. He was looking for a way out. He said, I don't want to have to love everybody. So if you could just define my neighbor so I can know where my love has to stop. And Jesus, he looks at him and he tells him this, this famous story. And so in verse 30, it says this, Jesus replied with a story. He said, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. So a man was walking down the road. He gets attacked by these bandits, and they beat him up, and they strip him of all his stuff. They steal his things, and they leave him on the side of the road to die. And this priest just so happened to be going down the road, and he sees this man. And you know what he decides to do? He just decides to straight up ignore it. He keeps his distance on the other side of the road. He, He pretended he didn't see it, and he kept walking. See, this is what I call avoidance. And sometimes you and I are like that. We avoid. We do our best to avoid people. We, we pretend we don't see a need. We pretend we don't have to, to help. And it's really easy to avoid people in today's world, right? Like it's super easy. I mean, you could be in the same room as somebody and it's just, you just get on your phone. And you don't even have to talk to anybody because you're like, oh, yeah, I'm busy. I'm scrolling. TikTok, you know what I mean? And so you're just like, it's really easy to avoid people. We live on the other side of the road, so consumed with our, with our own lives when we avoid helping. Maybe that's you. You're the first person. You're an avoider. Or maybe you're more like this uh, second guy. So in verse 32, it says, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side of the road. See, if the first guy was an avoider, then the second guy is curious but uncaring. He actually, th- th- he actually goes over to the man. It says he looks at him and he's like, ah, bummer. 
and then just walks on his way. That's worse than the first guy. At least the first guy was pretending he didn't even see him. The second guy saw the need, looked at it, and then walked away. And I, I know you're thinking, Jake, I would never do that. But we do it all the time in our personal lives. You ever see somebody crying out at lunch, like in the, in the courtyard? They're, like, they're just like going through something, and you're just like, bummer. And you just keep walking like we do it. How about when you know your friend's going through something hard? Maybe they're going through a breakup. What if their parents are getting divorced? Man, you know they're going through something, and you, as a friend group, you're talking about it. You're like, oh, did you, did you hear what Jared's going through? And you're like, What? What are they going through? You want all the juicy details, but you don't want to let them know that you're there for them. You're there to to help them or or talk with them. You don't want to shoot them a text or phone call because you want all the juicy details, but you don't want to do anything to help. You're curious but uncaring. See, if kindness is love in action, if kindness is simply love in action, then really this Kindness stops to help. If kindness is love in action, then I want to tell you, kindness stops to help. Look at this in in verse 33. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. So this third guy is on his way. He's traveling down the road. He sees this Jewish man beaten half to death, and he doesn't cross over to the other side of the road. He doesn't pretend like he didn't see it. He doesn't slow down to get a good look before going on his way. What does he do? He stops to help. See, he lets someone's need interrupt him. And I think if we stop being so consumed with ourselves, it would take us only a second to realize that there's people around us all the time, people in your row that are hurting. People that are hurting uh, emotionally or physically, people that are carrying loss or trauma with them. And if we see that, then we're called to stop and show kindness. Here's the thing, is we can't show kindness when we don't have the space to be interrupted. I mean, you can't show kindness when you know someone's going through a valley in their life, but you're too busy scrolling TikTok or Instagram to give them a phone call or shoot them a text. I, I want you to know this. I want you to know this. Kindness is God working in the world through you. Kindness is God working in the world through you. Let me show you what I mean. Some may say, uh, why, why, why didn't God help the man on, on the side of the road? Why didn't God step in and intervene and help this man on the side of the road? And I'll tell you this, he did. In fact, God sent three people, and two of them walked by, and one of them stopped to help. And see, it wasn't the two religious people. And just because you're religious doesn't mean you're kind. See, some of the rudest people I know I've met in church The kindest people are the people that stop so that God can work. See, you have the opportunity to be God to someone through love and action. Kindness is God working in the world through you. You and I have to get out of the way sometimes so that the Holy Spirit can do his work. And see, it's not just being kind to people we like. It's not just being kind to people we know and love or only kind to our kind it's, 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 it's kindness to everyone. Read, read this again. Then a despised Samaritan. Can I give you some background? The Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. In fact, the, the Jews had a saying that it was better to be a dog than to be a Samaritan. They counted Samaritans as, as less than animals. And Jesus says this, and then this person, this despised Samaritan, This person that you view so lowly of, that you discriminate against, this person you despise comes along. And see, and this Samaritan, instead of seeing that Jewish man bloody in a ditch, smiling because he thought he got what he deserves, you know what happened? Is he saw him and he felt compassion. 
he sympathized. He empathized. He put himself in the shoes of that person. Can I get a little scientific for a second? You and I have these things in our brains called mirror neurons. They're, they're called mirror neurons. And what they are is they mirror the emotion of people or situations around us. Like, that's why when you're watching Lion King and Mufasa dies, you cry, right? Because, like, those mirror neurons are, like, firing, and you're seeing Simba, and he's sad, and you're like, I'm sad. But some of us, see, we've trained our brains to not fire off sympathy or empathy when we see someone get hurt that we don't like. People that, that don't think like us or act like us, we trained our brains to believe they're not worth our time or emo emotions. Look, kindness to someone you know is easy. Kindness to someone that you, you don't know or that you don't think deserves it is difficult. But I want to tell you, we are called to be kind to everybody. Because can we be honest? You don't deserve the kindness that God showed you. We don't deserve the kindness that God showed us. In Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 5, it says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of our righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. See, when you were at your lowest, God showed you kindness. When you didn't deserve it, God showed you kindness. And the reality is that God says everyone gets kindness regardless if they deserve it. I want to end with this. I think we undervalue kindness because we don't understand the power that kindness has. I think you and I undervalue kindness because we don't understand the power that kindness has. And I believe God commands us to recognize, be recognized by our kindness, to be kind to others, to show love in action, because this kindness has the power to change the outcomes of situations. Kindness has the power to change the outcomes of situations. See, there's some people out there that think kindness is weak, but I'm telling you, kindness has power. If the Samaritan didn't stop to help this man and show him kindness, he would have died on the side of the road. And it's, I was scrolling social media, and there's some things that I just see that absolutely break my heart. And there was a story, I, I, you might have heard of it or, or seen it. It just it's recent. It recently happened. There's a father, and he he had a picture with his son in the hospital, and he was saying goodbye to his son. And his son died there. And what had happened is uh, they, he, he and his family had, had come home, and he, one of his daughters found his son in his room, and he had strangled himself with his sweatshirt. And so the father, he, he started performing CPR until the paramedics arrived, and they go to the hospital, and they told him, it's, it's too late, and his son passed away. And the father took to social media, and he posted this long post, and at the end of it, he says, listen, if you could just be kind, if you would have just been kind, this would have been avoidable, because my son came home, and he took his own life. Why? Because people were bullying him, because people had been unkind. And so he was just begging, just please be kind. If you had been kind, my son would still be here. See, unkindness has the power to take life, and kindness has the power to bring life. Look at this, Proverbs uh, chapter 18, verse 21 literally says, words kill and words give life. They're either poison or fruit, and you choose. Kindness can change the outcomes of situations. I want you to know this as, as we wrap up, that you have the opportunity, the privilege, the burden to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a cruel, unkind world. Can I tell you that it's your duty to live and love like Jesus, to be love in action. And see, when we, when we can get out of the way and let the Spirit do its work in us, the, we can breathe the power of life into situations. So you were meant for more than just your day-to-day -day agenda and the things on your schedule, you were made to stop and show kindness. Can I ask you to be a part of a generation that steps up, even when it's difficult, to love your enemies and the people that don't look like you and the people that don't act like you, and step in and defend the people that get bullied or put down and to show kindness in the world? Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and your kindness today. Lord, I pray that we can extend that to others 
uh, this day, this week as we leave here today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray for Jake. Lord, we just thank you for this word from Jake. And uh, Lord, I just pray for Jake and his ministry at Cross City. Pray that you would bless him, bless his home. And uh, we love you. And we want to be those that represent you. And we praise you. Amen. Amen.